webinar on equitable teaching practices with cultural relevance in financial education for the 9-12 grade band. Um, I am the Special Populations Program Supervisor, as Tracy mentioned, and I am so happy to be here with you today and share some of the data that we found pertaining to our students, the impacts that are affecting their academic and financial success, and some amazing resources we have found. So that's gonna be part of our learning objectives for this webinar. Uh, we're gonna be learning about our BIPOC students specifically, as well as students who are new to the country, students who may be um, document deficient, who may be undocumented and face barriers to access uh, financial and academic resources and opportunities. We will also learn some really interesting research on how culture impacts um, financial values and financial decision making. And finally, we will be learning about some culturally relevant resources to teach uh, financial education in the 9-12 grade band. So now I wanna go ahead and tell you a little bit more about me. Um, I was born and raised in the Dominican Republic. That's a very small but beautiful island in the Caribbean. My first language is Spanish. I emigrated to the United States, specifically to New York City at the age of 10. Um, I attended New York University and obtained degrees in early childhood education, early childhood special education, and a second major in Spanish literature with an area of focus in Latin and American studies. Um, prior to working with FEP, I worked as an interpreter and translator with different social service agencies uh, providing help to our most underserved and underrepresented communities and community members. Currently, as I mentioned, I am the Special Populations Program Supervisor for FEP, and I'm going to go into greater depth on what that means and what specific student groups and populations I support. My hobbies are reading, hiking, love the outdoors. I moved uh, to Olympia, Washington, October of 2022, have been here now a little over one year. Incredible. I, it feels like it was yesterday, and sometimes it feels like I've been here for 10 years. And I like to tell my family, Olympia is like a town inside of a forest. It's absolutely beautiful. I love the evergreens. I love the nature. I love all of it. Aside from that, I love cooking and I love eating, but my passion really is supporting financial education for our most disadvantaged students. So I have told you a little bit about me. Now I wanna tell you a little bit more about FEP. And FEP was created by legislators, legislators, excuse me, um, that wanted to make sure financial education was a priority in the K-12 public school system. So our approach to uh, providing financial education to our students in K-12 is to provide professional development um, that's one of our priorities, providing professional development to our educators in K-12 so that they feel confident and feel ready and well prepared to teach this content and include it and incorporate it into other core uh, competencies such as math, English, and science. Our other priority, of course, is to continue to identify equitable, high-quality financial education resources so all our students have access to um, resources that represent their, their real life real life experiences that have a lot of um, cultural integration, cultural representation, and that have a high degree of inclusivity. That's another one of our priorities. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to expand a little more on what the term special populations means. So the term special population refers to students who face barriers to access the same academic and educational opportunities and resources easily available to all other students. Um, our special population students are, I love the animation on this slide. I always show it off whenever I can just to give you an idea of the whole group of special population. Okay, so at this point, I wanna sh share more about our commitment to equity in financial education. We've been working with educators that have been teaching financial education for a long time, and they shared some of their stories and challenges on how their aha moment came when they were teaching financial education and realized that 
it wasn't as inclusive as they would like it to be. Um, traditionally, financial education resources um, have been created for the middle and upper middle class, uh, students who were not ethnic, students who were not culturally diverse. And when students and educators, sorry, were carrying out instruction, they realized that some students who, who were culturally di diverse, students who came from low-income families, low-income households were not engaging, were not feeling represented in the material. So they started noticing and implementing changes to the existing resources and curriculum so that their students could again engage and gain some knowledge and actually find the content useful and relatable to their own life lift experiences. Now, this is a really great resource for educators. I have linked it directly to this um, PowerPoint and as a PDF, and it is also available as a PDF directly linked to our website, feb.org. Again, I wanna mention our commitment to equity. We realize that equality and equity are two very different things and we strive to be equitable as much as possible. Why? Because handing a student the same resource, handing all students the same resource may not meet their needs. Equity is different from equality because it assures that students are getting not the same resource necessarily, but the resource that best meets their academic needs and that would engage them more and acquire and so they can acquire as much knowledge as possible. With that in mind, uh, whenever we vet resources, whenever we consider resources to share on our website, feb.org, you're going to hear me say feb.org a lot, by the way, because I want you guys to check it out. We have so many incredible resources there. We use a bias and sensitivity screening tool that was created by OSPI and is used by other programs in OSPI to make sure that the resources we share are free of implicit and explicit bias. And it goes even further because it really creates it gives us a lens for us to see and consider students of different backgrounds, make sure that uh, as much as possible materials are representing uh, different cultures, different values, students from different uh, customs, students with different religions, students who identify with different pronouns, students with different family compositions. Not everybody has a mom and dad at home. Some of our students live with grandma. Some of our students live with foster parents and other guardians. So it's really important and we do prioritize resources that have um, high representation of all of our diverse students and are as inclusive as possible. And that's part really of our holistic approach to financial education. We consider our students' uh, cultures, as our students' value values, Whenever possible, we prioritize resources that are free. Some of them do require registration for, by the educator, but for the most part, the, the resources that we promote are directly linked in our website and are free of charge. And we also know that our students have different learning styles. Our students have different learning preferences. So whenever possible, we try to promote when we find good games, activities, uh, comics, we have educational comics. I'll be talking about that a little later on, um, as well as full curriculums, units, lessons. We add all of that and incorporate it into our list of resources to make sure that our students with different learning styles find um, materials they can engage with. Additionally, we know this is a very diverse state we have students from all over the world, families from all over the world joining our great state of Washington. So as much as possible, whenever we find uh, resources available in more than one language, we also prioritize that and promote it in our website. I am bilingual and biliterate in English and Spanish. And my colleague, Amy Cleaver, the elementary program supervisor is also bilingual and biliterate in English and Spanish. So we do have the ability to vet resources to make sure that they have high quality translation in English and Spanish. We do promote other languages. I cannot vouch that the translations are equitable, but they do usually come from reputable resources. So we are more than happy to share that with our educators through our website, feb.org. And that's feb with three Ps in case I forgot to mention that. Okay, so at this point, I would like to share some impactful data pertaining to our students who face barriers, as I mentioned earlier, to access financial education resources as well as other academic resources due to experiencing economic hardship. 
So one of the things that we learn is that students in over half of the categories of special populations face economic hardship and housing insecurity. Now, many of you may find this surprising and share the same concerns we have about how incredibly prevalent this issue is and the incredibly high number of students that are being impacted by it. We know that experiencing economic hardship can be traumatic enough. But when on top of that, you experience housing insecurity, that takes it to a whole nother level. And we try to support our on-home on students as much as possible. But to do this, we need to understand and gain deeper awareness of the challenges that they face. So when we look at data specifically for our on-home on students in Washington, we learn we have around 36,784 students who are currently on-homed. Now, over 60% of our students in that, in, that are on-homed are students of color. I find this extremely shocking as minorities are, they don't make the, the majority of our student groups, they're the minority, but they're overrepresented in this category to a great degree. Um, we know that the McKinney-Vento Act is a federal law ensuring the um, academic enrollment of our on-home students, but even with that, we still have a lot of on-home students who don't have access to high quality continuous education and educational resources because they do move around at higher rates. And a student is considered unhomed if they meet one or more of the categories that you see on screen. And I will give you a few more moments to read through that. 